anyways, okay, it's uh, it's it's 101, so I'd want to get started. It's a pleasure to welcome Rabbi Dr. Zev Aleph, even on Tishba, but even especially on Tishba, I don't know, um, a chief academic officer at uh, Hebrew Theological College in, in Skokie, associate professor of Jewish history at, at Turo, a prolific author, has written a wonderful book on uh, American Jewish history, American Orthodox history, and... Um, and um, Pleasure. I'm going to mute everybody, which I forgot to do, and then I'm going to unmute you, Zeb. So give me one second, and then you can start. You're probably muted. Okay, Ze uh, Dr. Zeb, you should be able to speak. And I, I do want to mention that our learning today, I didn't mention it before, is sponsored in memory of Mayor and Sylvia Zeichman and uh, Rabbi Yasher Turin. Uh, all of, of, of Toronto we want to thank the Zeichman family for their sponsorship of uh, the learning dedicated for their parents and in memory of Rabbi Tour and also those in Toronto, I think, know who he was. Okay, Vakasha, Dr. Ella, okay. thank, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rabbi Kalman. Uh, terrific uh, to learn with all of you. You know, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, Thank goodness, I suppose, is that we have, uh, you know, the Shulchan Aruch really circumscribes what you can learn on Tisha B'Av. But now, counterintuitively, everybody looks forward to Tisha B'Av learning. Uh, but in any case, uh, uh, my assignment is to consider Tisha B'Av in the American or North American, we'll say, uh, Jewish experience. And you know, every holiday has its own character. Every holiday has its own ability to adapt and to take root in the new world, in new soil. Uh, Hanukkah certainly competes with other uh, non-Jewish uh, Christian holidays, Christmas, obviously. Uh, Pesach, as a time of deliverance, has this uh, timelessness to it, and certainly the Haggadah and how it Americanizes over time is certainly something we know all about. Uh, certainly uh, its success in uh, Maxwell House and making sure that its product is no longer considered to be kidney oat. Uh, so it proves its own Haggadah has its own story. Tishbab, maybe because it's not a happy occasion, but Tishbab, I think maybe more than any other uh, plotted point on the Jewish calendar has had a very curious and interesting and I think very provocative history uh, in the United States. And so what I want to present here, and, and I hope that um, through comments and maybe uh, if I uh, move quickly enough, we can have a discussion perhaps, but is how Tisha B'Av reincarnates itself over time. So it's none too popular, for example, in the 19th century. Uh, here you have a silhouette of Isaac Harvey, the very first, we could probably say, reformed Jew in the United States. Harvey is a playwright, is a journalist. He's also a uh, young Jew with deep roots in Charleston, South Carolina, who at the time was the largest community in North America with 500 Jewish women and men. It outpaced New York for just a few more years. Uh, and Harby, uh, along with a number of young people, about 40 in all, he announces to his parents and grandparents at Congregation Beth Elohim, which is still around today, uh, could you please quit it with the Spanish, they were a Sephardic, a Spanish-Portuguese congregation, with the Spanish Aliot, with the Misha Beirachs, with the language. Can you please introduce more English? Can you please make the congregation, the synagogue, the ritual more, uh, more comfortable for us young people, many of us, first generation American Jews? Uh, they kindly or not so kindly say, no way. Uh, and in 1824, uh, Harvey and his group founds the uh, Reform Society of Israelites in Charleston, South Carolina. In November 21st, 1825, they have a, uh, an anniversary. They have their anniversary banquet, and Harvey delivers a discourse which is published in the newspapers, which uh, becomes a standalone pamphlet. He sends it to Thomas Jefferson, to John C. Calhoun, to major politicians who write back to him, congratulating him on uh, his 40-page discourse. Uh, more well-known, perhaps, 
than any other line, any other passage in the text is this one uh, in the text in front of you. The great cause of improvement, uh, capitalizing I improvement from, uh, that's how it was done as English was moving from its German incarnate with its nouns usually capitalized in government, in religion, in morals, in literature is the greatest cause of mankind. After all, this is uh, about 50 years since the American Revolution. This is very much on people's minds. Bigotry and despotism may rear their miscreated fronts to thwart your way, but the consuming beams of truth must drive them back to their original darkness. In this happy land, however, you have no such obstacles to oppose. Yeah, maybe that's the case in Europe for Jews, for other people, but not in this happy land of the United States. Equally of laws and freedoms of conscience leave you a wide and cheerful field to act upon. And that idea of happy landism uh, gets picked up on and is parlayed forward in Charleston itself, and we'll see elsewhere. So you see this text uh, on the top left is the image of Beth Elohim before its fire uh, in the late 1830s. Uh, on the directly juxtaposed to it on the bottom right is the, the new congregation, uh, still exists today. Uh, and this is a passage which is written up in the Charleston Courier. By then, uh, Harvey has moved to New York. Many of his colleagues have as well, but some of the original founders of the Reform Society of Israelites uh, have now pushed the major congregation, Beth Elohim, to introduce reforms. The first one is that they've removed uh, Yom Tov Sheni. Everybody complains about Yom Tov Sheni, but they actually did something about it. Not advising it here. Um, uh, and Gustavus Posansky, they introduced an organ, and there's a major court case about doing about introducing an organ, and what are the uh, what are the contours of Orthodox halacha at that point? Uh, but when he dedicates the new synagogue building. Set, writes, goes to, uh, delivers Gustavus Poznanski, and it's reported in March 20th, 1841. And I've given you on the top right, you see the excerpt, but he, he says the following. He says about um, enjoyed by the house of Israel in this land of liberty and equal rights, uh, we, he kindled with a noble and generous enthusiasm and declared in behalf of himself and all grateful uh, Israelites that, this is quoting Poznanski, this synagogue is our temple, this city our Jerusalem, this happy land, this is not a political statement, our Palestine. And so this happy land and replacing Jerusalem with America, replacing the temple with the local synagogue. And he's not talking about the, the rabbinic uh, adage of a mikdash ma'at, not at all. He is looking to America as a new Zion, a new Jerusalem. And as you can imagine, the traditional exponents are none too happy about Poznanski. And if that was, remember, so, so just to understand the reception history, Harvey, uh, coins the phrase happy land in 1825. It's still, uh, it, it's still in the air when Poznanski delivers, delivers it as a dedication ceremony in 1841, and when the Orthodox established Sherith Israel, uh, its congregation in Charleston, its new rabbinic figure, uh, Jacob Rosenfeld, he he writes the following, and it's published in a Philadelphia Jewish newspaper in 1847. Thou knowest we are bereft of our country, and we must sing praises in a strange land. He's not talking about hippie culture here. We have now no Jerusalem, no temple, no high priest, and no burnt offering for thy worship. In other words, orthodoxy versus reform Judaism is being uh, simplified. It's making it, it's its discrete difference is whether or not this is truly a happy land. Harvey 
has made it his business that Reform Judaism, the Reform Society of Israelites, is co-signed to the American Revolution, to the early republic. Poznansky, when he dedicates the temple bigger and better than ever, a Bet Elohim, what's picked up on by the local newspaper is how his congregation, what's called the Cradle of Reform Judaism, Beth Elohim, uh, is replacing Zion, replacing Jerusalem. It is now this happy land. And when the Orthodox, they finally fortify themselves in that very same city, the major polemical point is that we have no Jerusalem. There is a Jerusalem, but it's not a Jewish Jerusalem. No temple. And orthodoxy is one that yearns for the temple in Jerusalem. And it's happening outside of Charleston. Absolutely. And so a letter from Rebecca Gratz, uh, the well-known philanthropist uh, in Philadelphia, to her sister Miriam, uh, she writes in 1841, uh, directly after getting some word of that Charleston Courier report. Writes Rebecca to sister Miriam, I have not seen the paper you sent containing an account of the Charleston congregation, presumably the Courier, that's the only, uh, that's the primary source we have for it. But I've heard some passages quoted that are certainly unorthodox. This is our temple. This is our city. This is our Palestine. So you can see that she hasn't read the courier. It's being sent to her uh, as, we, as she writes, but she's heard about it. It's in the air. It's among Jews' discussion. Uh, there are about 18, there are about, I should say about 100 to 150,000 Jews living in, in the United States at that time. My, Toronto has not yet emerged, but Montreal certainly has. Uh, and they're talking about this sermon, this de synagogue dedication sermon, uh, in which Poznanski has deigned to take action against uh, this idea of, of really what we're observing today, what we're, what we're uh, sitting around and mourning for, which is Tisha uh, Continues Rebecca Gratz, then where is the truth of prophecy? Where do you make sense? She was a, a biblical Jew. Uh, she wrote uh, educational curricula, textbooks. Uh, she built a day, uh, essentially a Sunday school that was built around uh, teachings of the Chumash, of Tanakh. What do you do? If you get rid of Jerusalem, then where is the truth of prophecy? Where is the fulfillment of promises? What is the hope of Israel? And what does the scattered people bear witness? Alas, we may hang our harps, referring to the Levium, on the willow and weep for the spiritual destruction of Jerusalem when her own children are content to sing the songs of Zion in a strange land and deny the words of God so often repeated by the prophets. For Rebecca, Kratz, for Rebecca Gratz, excuse me, Poznansky's declaration, his, his, his reform agenda, does not compute with her biblical sense of Jewishness. You can't have a Jewishness without Nevi'im and Ketuvim. You can't have a Judaism that does not long, that does not yearn for the restoration of the Jewish people in Yerushalayim. And one final piece of the reception history, taking it at least to the 1850s, is Morris Raphael, who comes to this country in 1849. He is at that time the highest paid rabbi in the United States, a whopping $2,000 a year. And, uh, but because it's a, a pretty large sum at that time, uh, the congregation, he arrives around Passover 1849 of Pesach, and uh, the congregation tells him, we can't afford to pay you until we start your contract at Rosh Hashanah. Even back then, rabbis started their uh, uh, contracts Rosh Hashanah, during the high holidays. And so he said, they said to him, good luck to you, sir. Um, good luck earning your keep, but we can't afford to pay you. We're excited to have you come September, uh, but right now you're on your own. So he delivers, uh, he goes on a tour 
he goes on a tour of, of American Jewish sites and cities, and he delivers lectures. He's the fir very first scholar in residence in American Jewish history. And here I give you a, uh, a poster uh, of, um, of where uh, one of his stops, particularly in Philadelphia. He goes to Philadelphia twice, actually. And at one point, he ends up in Charleston. He goes as far south as New Orleans um, and uh, as far north, uh, really, as New York. So he's really covering quite a bit of ground. And in Charleston, he actually engages, uh, it's, the, it, it's a festering storm. The battles between orthodoxy and reform are very much in the air. Uh, one of the architects of reform Judaism, actually, Isaac Mayer Wise, has come down just to debate and hopefully getting Poznanski's job. Poznanski's just uh, uh, submitted his resignation. He's going to retire in 1850, so Wise comes down. Um, but Rafael comes down as the chief exponent of Orthodox Judaism. He is a learned fellow. He speaks the king. Uh, he speaks the king's or the queen's English, depending on who you ask, um, and. Uh, here we have a pamphlet of his speech in Charleston. You tell us, he's speaking to Orthodox, but he's really speaking to the Reform, that these United States are Jerusalem, that Israel wishes for no restoration. Remember, he's, he's a foreigner. <clears throat> he's an immigrant. He hasn't, he's spent of only a few months in this country, and yet he has been equipped with this uh, past knowledge, with this history in Charleston, wishes for no restoration and has none to expect. And so, because a handful of Jews in these states recovered those inalienable rights, he also knows Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, which belonged to them as men, <clears throat> because here are a few, not one in a hundred, of the professors of the faith of Israel throughout the world are relieved from the grievous pressure from without against which their brethren in the faith have everywhere to bear up because here the lowest and most material of their animal wants can be provided for with abundance. And the finger of scorn is not actually and pointedly uh, held up at the Jew because you think that there isn't uh, anti-Semitism would not be a, a real word for another 15 years, but anti-Jewishness. Therefore, he is to sever his hopes and interests from his suffering brethren. He supposes that the root of this anti-Jerusalem reform has much to do with feeling safe, feeling secure in this happy land, and maybe he's right. Um, he is to sever his hopes and interests from his suffering brethren, and is not only to rob them of that energy, that mortal motive, which so long has sustained them, this drive to return to Yerushalayim, but is even to outrage their feelings and lacerate their hearts by telling them that their constancy is folly, their firm adherence to principle, st uh, stiff-neckedness, their deeply rooted faith, a delusion. And he's aware of it. He's aware of this declaration that is passed on from Harvey to Poznanski to others. Um, but it's an attitude. It's an attitude um, born out of safety and security. Maybe, depending on your interpretation, complacency. But it's one that if you're going to adopt America and Americanism, is there really a place to mourn for Jerusalem? And it's much in the discussion, certainly in the rabbinic discourse of American Jewish life. Uh, here is... Uh, an article that appeared in a New York magazine, a newspaper, a weekly newspaper in uh, August 1854 by Dr. Max Lilienthal. Uh, you can see, it, I give you the citation, it's LD. Uh, he, uh, um, it, was, it was well known it was him. LD uh, is backward for Dr. Lilienthal. Apparently his mother named him Dr. Not Max. Uh, there is a second party and he's outlining in this interesting essay all the different fragments of American Jewry. There's a second party that has already come more in contact with the world. And that wish, so he's first outlined the uh, deeply pious traditional Orthodox Jews. Now he has a second group that, with sagacious foresight, understands very well that something must be done to satisfy the wants of the time. They know that they have to adapt in some way. These are not the reformers, but they realize that they have to move in some way, in some palatable form. It is the party of, and see party, it's very much a uh, political uh, conversation, the party 
of external order and decorum. They are willing, as the bolded section, to add something to the services and religious ceremonies, but will never agree that anything should be subtracted therefrom. They do not wear their beard anymore in the nine days of Av, and gives a couple of explanations. So what are they willing to do? They are willing to give up the nine days of the three weeks, um, maybe even portions of Tisha B'Av. So the, the hallmark of what this group, whether they're quasi-traditionalists, modern reformers, this, the second group that is willing to adapt in some way, um, the marquee item is to dispatch with some of the mourning, the trappings of Chodesh Here is Rabbi David Einhorn, a radical reformer who arrives in the United States in the 1850s. And he immediately seizes on Tisha B'Av. He says, you know what, I can't do reform. I can't do my version of American Judaism if we're going to maintain, if we're going to retain Korban Beis HaMikdash, if we're going to still uh, observe Tisha B'Av. And so in, uh, he, he actually, it appears in his very first uh, oration, his, his, uh, his um, coronation drusha, so to speak, uh, in 1855 in Baltimore in Harsana. Um, it already appears there, but his fullest uh, denunciation of Tisha B'Av appears a few years later in 1859. I'm I tr this is my translation from the original German. You didn't want to, today you didn't want to hear me read German. Many ask, why do we, who do not care to return to Palestine, observe the Chorban Beis HaMikdash? He actually wrote it in, in Hebrew characters, Chorban Beis HaMikdash. Uh, this is asked only by those who see nothing in Reform Judaism but a matter of convenience. Many of them chant keynotes without fasting, uh, which is a, quite a, an accusation, drape the synagogue in black, but don't shed a tear. They do it pro forma. They do it because they have to, but they lack the meaningfulness of Tisha B'Av accuses Einhorn. For us, however, next to Sinai, uh, which is both his ideology, but also the name of his congregation, this day marks the most important occurrence in our history. Okay, so we're all on the same page. This is a very important day. The rabbis in a prophetic spirit said, thus today we celebrate the birthday of the Messiah, it's Gemara and Sanhedrin, namely Israel and the beginning of its messianic activities. On Passover, we celebrated the redemption from Egypt are having been chosen as God's firstborn. But today we celebrate, all right, so now I'm getting a little uneasy uh, as an Orthodox Jew here, but today we celebrate the birth of Israel as a redeemer of mankind. For on this day began our wanderings throughout the world. And Einhorn borrows this from other reform thinkers in Europe, but Tishbab is transformed into a happy occasion because the destruction of the temple, uh, ironically for them, in this interpretation that is, it frees the Jewish people to be an Orla Goyim. It frees the Jewish people to go into the exile and spread the values of monotheism. And the fact that the Gemara in Sanhedrin and uh, Einhorn was a deeply learned fellow, uh, studied with the same teachers of Rabbi Samson and Raphael Hirsch actually, um, he looks at the, uh, the, the, the passage in the, the, toward the end of the Gemara and Sanhedrin of the birth of Messiah on Tisha B'Av as to say that here it is, that this is our messianic period. And Tisha B'Av is the moment which we celebrate. We don't mourn. We celebrate the opportunity to bring ethical monotheism into the world. And so Tisha B'Av should be celebrated. And this becomes sort of the, the theology of Reform Judaism for Tisha for many, many years. And it even pivots somebody who looms so large as Isaac Mayer Wise. Um, here is a, a young picture of Wise that he, he might have looked like when he first came to this country in the 1840s. And in his memoirs, actually written later, but um, a uh, very poignant, usually very accurate on point, probably drawn from uh, uh, a manuscript which he started when he first arrived in this country. And he speaks about, he writes about how Dr. Leo Mersbacher on the left side, this is originally in German translated 
uh, into English around the turn of the 20th century. Dr. Leo Mersbacher, the founding rabbi of Temple Emmanuel, still to this day on the east side of New York. It's not in the same building that he had, the same congregation. A blessed memory preached. There was nothing talking about how he visited this newly reformed congregation uh, in New York City on Tisha B'Av. There was nothing in his delivery to attract a stranger. Okay, so he wasn't a big fan of Mersbacher, but he spoke of the end of Gullus, of the morn of the morning that was dawning also for the house of Israel. His words made me feel. This is why I'm uh, reading it. His words made me feel at home. Although he, he did not treat the Tisha B'Av as drastically as I should have wished. So on the one hand, he was welcoming. On the one hand, he was speaking to somebody with a liberal religious spirit. On the other hand, uh, he was turned off, was wise of the founding rabbi of Emmanuel about how unserious Tisha B'Av was in that congregation. Well, wise would eventually change his mind and in, by 1863, when he's moved from New York to Albany and now to Cincinnati, uh, he's the founder of Hebrew Union College, which is um, its main center at one point was, it still exists today, but it's not, its main center is now New York, but its main center was in Cincinnati, Ohio. He writes in, uh, in his Israelites, his newspaper in Cincinnati in 1863, gentlemen of the old school speak, the Orthodox, loudly against our late Cleveland sermon on Zechariah 19, uh, all about uh, mourning and redemption concerning the abrogation of national fast days. Uh, the Martin Rosh Hashanah talks about the possibility that in the eight Shalom and happy times, I think that we're all agree that right now is not a happy time, for, some, for a myriad of reasons, that maybe you can dispense with the morning of Tisha B'Av. Uh, it's not much observed. Uh, the Torah and others, other codifiers point out that it's not something that we're prepared to do ever for Tisha B'Av until you most Mashiach. Uh, so concerning the abrogation of national fast days, including the ninth day of Av, called by the prophet the fast of the fifth, the fifth month that is Av, we, for, we forgot then and there to quote the passage from the Talmud where the same thing is stated. Oh, here is the Gemara Rosh uh, Skipping forward, the prophets call these days fast. And then again, days of joy and gladness, namely, when peace prevails, uh, see, you didn't need me, wise teaches us uh, anyway, they will be for the joy and gladness. When persecution exists, they are days of fast. But if neither exists, those who choose may fast, and those who choose otherwise shall not fast. Again, by normative halacha, uh, we're very cautious about this, but here's the, here's the trigger point. It is not necessary, thunders wise, to be more orthodox than the Talmud. And so he too has moved around and said, you know what? We don't need Tisha B'Av, although in 1863, America was not exactly a peaceful time either. Uh, and so Tisha B'Av languishes in, in America. So you have a, a, a reporter in Philadelphia in 1877. Um, Tisha the fast of Av has indeed in the, in the framed section Nowadays, few adherents, with one or perhaps two exceptions, the attendance at the synagogue might have been reckoned upon uh, the fingers. You can count them on one hand, how many synagogues are doing uh, Tisha B'Av by the 1870s. Reform Judaism is, uh, was, was a first arrival to Orthodox congregations, and now it has emerged as the preeminent group within uh, the, the uh, tapestry of American Judaism. But by the 1880s, things are changing. By the 1880s, uh, Tisha B'Av is gaining new currency, really for two reasons. Number one, uh, European Jews are under siege. Uh, uh, a spate of major pogroms beginning in 1881 with the assassination of Tsar Alexander II. Uh, Jews are blamed for it, and there are major programs leaving many starting, really activating a wave of migration that would escalate, that would, that would raise the total population of Jews in the United States. In 1880, that number was a quarter million, 250,000. By 1900, 20 years later, it quadrupled into a million. By 1920, there were between three and four million Jews in the United States. 
and Canada is emerging um, proportionally the same way. 250,000 Jews becomes a million between 1880 and 1900, many of them looking for economic opportunity in the United States, but many others sensing that the jig is up, that now we can, now the term is coined, anti-Semitism is, is, is sadly abounding in the Eastern European uh, Jewish experience. And what it does is that it reawakens, it re-enlivens meaningfulness for Tisha B'Av. And here is a, uh, an editor in the Jewish record, uh, a not so well-known Jewish newspaper out of Philadelphia. I've been trying to make sure that we're not New York centric today, that we are drawing from all sorts of different sources. America, the liberal and the enlightened has never lifted up a hand to strike the Hebrew, which is pretty much true to that point. On the contrary, she referring to America, generously invited him to come and thrive and rise high in her vast domains. The outcasts of Judea, who was yet the pariah of a narrow-minded world, availed himself of the offer, and for over a century has lived free from the molestation vexations to which he has been exposed, even ever and anon in regions where he had sought shelter. Therefore, Israelites love America and seek her welfare, but the appreciation of their favorable conditions does not blot out the memories of the past. So here it's beginning like a Poznanski or, or a Harvey sermon. It's absolutely true, the editor contends in 1885 of this Philadelphia Jewish newspaper, that we are living in a Medina Shel Chaseh. We're living in a place that is bereft of anti-Semitism, that you feel safe. For the most part, that's correct. But whereas Reform Judaism, this was an orthodox leaning newspaper, the Jewish record, while Reform Judaism carried that forward and said, okay, so that means that we have to make America into, as part of our religious fabric, this is where it moves in the other direction. Therefore, Israelites love America and seek her welfare. But the appreciation <clears throat> of their favorable conditions does not blot out the memories of the past, nor the compassionate feelings toward brethren who are still the target of uh, inveterate bigotry. The ninth of Av, Tisha B'Av, awakens afresh those reminiscences and those sentiments so that the faithful among the free lament with the enslaved, referring to uh, persecution in Europe, the results of the occurrences upon that fateful day. So there's a lot happening here. So first of all, let's also recall that when you came to America, you were risking a lot uh, in the early 19th century. You were going by sail. So it would take you three weeks to travel from, let's say, the port of Portugal to Ellis Island, to New York, or to ports in uh, Boston, New York, uh, Philadelphia, Baltimore. And you were risking your life. If there was disease on the ship, you might not survive to uh, disembark them. Uh, because it was three weeks, it cost a lot of money uh, to set sail. There was food, there were costs, there was a, a larger staff. By the 1860s, 1870s, however, uh, more and more people started to travel by steam. And so that same trip that would take by sail three weeks, all of a sudden was shortened to six days. And so there was less risk involved. And it was, uh, you didn't need as much of a staff to move the ship across the Atlantic. Uh, to construct the steamship obviously cost more money, but all in all, it was a cheaper experience and it was a safer experience. And what that meant was not only did you, could Jews come to America more safely, but they could also return back to Europe if they needed to. They could travel. Many Americans for the first time were traveling back and forth uh, from America to Europe, were visiting, were trading. Uh, it, there was less risk involved now. There's more risk involved now, but I'm talking about then in the 1870s, 1880s. And because of that, it shrunk the world. Because of that, people, Jews living in America, did not have to see themselves as only Americans. They could retain their attachment 
to Jews and really to non-Jews living on the other side of the Atlantic in Europe because they, A, they could travel there and B, because they were closer, they could receive news at a much faster pace. And so what's happening in this text over here that's in front of you is that you see that it's not just that they're reform versus orthodox, but the mindset is that we are more attached than ever before to the plight of Jews in Europe. Yes, we are safe, but because we are safe, we have an obligation to support and to think very considerably about the travesty of European Judaism going on uh, in places like Russia and elsewhere. And so because of that, Tishba becomes freighted with altogether new meaning. We're safe, that's true. We're just as safe as, as Poznansky and Harvey were in the 1820s and 1840s. But we're more connected than ever before to the situation and the conditions in Europe. Solomon Solis Cohn, writing in a New York Jewish newspaper, uh, writes the following, also in the 1880s, 1881, so on the brink of the, of the large wave of migration. And the lesson of the Ninth of Av is that we must not alone wail, but work. We must be true to the obligations imposed upon the children of Abraham, which if we but knew it, <clears throat> are our highest and dearest privileges. And the promises of reward for renewed obedience will be as strictly fulfilled as were the threatenings of punishment for disobedience. As in the one case, so in the other. There are to be inevitable results of the workings of the law of cause and effect. We have but to do our duty and entrust the issue of the great first cause. What is the first cause for Solomon Solis Cohn? <clears throat> it's proto-Zionism. We're not yet at the Herzl, that would be uh, in another decade or so. But all of a sudden there are rumblings about a return to the Holy Land. And so it's not just the acrimony and the sadness of, of pogrom that's going on in Eastern Europe, but it's also attaching Jews or reattaching people to Tisha B'Av is the sense of a return to Zion, it's possible. And if it's possible, well then we better not forget it. The Gemara, I think, in Baba Basra, Mishalom it Abel al Jerusalem, in Oz Zochal Yerol Kesim Chos. I believe it. If I paraphrase, I'm sorry if I got it wrong a little bit. Um, but all of a sudden they realize we have to be sad about it because we're on the brink of it. And these are the underpinning, the first cause of a renewed Zionist spirit. And so, as you might expect, this these new mindsets, these new framing of Tisha B'av caused something of a renewal for the Fast of Av in the early 20th century. So I've given you a non-Jewish newspaper, no connections at all, the New Era, uh, talking about the Orthodox. And with Eastern European migration, there's a reawakening of Orthodoxy. Let us now cast a glance into the strict Orthodox community to study the ritual observed in the Ninth of Av. All of a sudden, it's not just how, the news reports aren't just how Tisha is not observed. It's curious. It's being observed. On the eve of the fast day, the people in stockings or slippers, so they didn't have crocs, are seated on the floor of the synagogue. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, Tisha B'Av looks a lot like the way that we do it, not this year, but maybe last year, and hopefully next year. Or hopefully, we won't need it. Tisha B'Av will, be, uh, will have reasons to celebrate in earnest. But in any case, this is looking a lot like our Tisha B'Av, this Eastern European migration. Talking about business is not is in general interrupted in the ghetto, referring to the Lower East Side of New York and Manhattan during the day. When the houses of the pious and the synagogues and the, and the lodsmen shopping, <clears throat> the candles for the dead are burning. The children do not play in the streets as usual. The people do not greet one another. This is a non-Jewish report that is pretty much on the mark. This is a recognizable scene of Tisha B'Av. And in another Jewish newspaper, the Jewish Exponent, <clears throat> the fast of Tisha B'Av comes this year at a time, this is in 1921, when the hope uh, that the glorious past of the Holy Land will be revived. After 1921, this is after the Balfour Declaration, this is after Zionist Congresses plenty have been convened, and there's much stirring for a return to Zion, for a return to Yerushalayim, to Eretz Yisrael. And so here are evidence that Eastern European migration has borne out a new spirit of Tisha B'Av, but also Zionism has rekindled an energy for the occasion. And almost out of a, out of, it's, it's ironic, out of a spirit of hope, 
comes a requirement to embark on the sorrow. It's really coming out of happy occasions, but they're a reminder that if, we're go if, we're, if it's gonna get really good, then we better take Tishba very seriously, say Jews in the United States. And maybe two final items, two final items um, that really throughout the 20th century, and I offered this with some speculation, but the rise of Jewish camping and sadly the Shoah, the Holocaust, do much to elevate Tisha B'Av to the station that it occupies today. The reason why there are so many of us right now on this Zoom, uh, Zoom webinar and thousands of Jews studying Tisha B'Av who in a, again, in an ironic twist, look forward to studying the tragedy of the occasion. So here is a camo off, uh, and I'll thank uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Shuli Berger at Yeshiva University Archives for supplying me uh, with this text. Shuli's absolutely a, a phenomenal friend and a scholar in her own right. Uh, the observance of the Eve of Tisha B'Av is in 1924 of a uh, tradition abiding uh, summer camp. Was indeed beautiful and traditional. Seated on the floor, campers and a funny spelling of counselors, recalled the periodic exiles, which began with the first and second destruction of the temple. Uncle Hal Koppelman, in his characteristic way, held his audience spellbound by his dramatic narration of the history of Tisha B'Av. So this is not the first occasion in 1924 in which this camp is doing Tisha B'Av. It was something that they looked forward to. Then Uncle Bernie, uh, interrupted the history, interpreted, excuse me, the history of Tisha B'Av, past and present. They were making meaning out of Tisha B'Av. He pointed out the significance of the dispersion of our people and what is the modern condition of the Jew. He's trying to contemporize Tisha B'Av, in other words. And as a fitting climax to the evening, Cantor, Cantor, okay, born to be a Cantor, chanted the Kinos. Interesting also, Kinos as spelled with an S, not a T, so it's an Ashkenazic pronunciation. So uh, that's um, that hints at the fact this is an Eastern European community, not one, not an Orthodoxy, which was a holdover from the German, which they would have probably still used keynotes. A word of praise is an order for the Hebrew gr uh, group, which was led by our very able Hirsch Stein. So it doesn't take much work to unpack this text camp and young people at camp looked forward to Tisha B'Av. Why? I, that meant no swimming for at least nine days, maybe instructional swimming, but not recreational swimming. Uh, it meant no live music, but there was something about camp. Summer camp was always looked to. Didn't matter if you were Orthodox, conservative, reform, Zionist, all the different, secular, all the different types of summer camps emerged much more at a much greater pace than any other uh, faith group in the United States. Jewish camping was, a was seized on as a terrific method to inculcate and incubate Jewishness. <clears throat> and for tradition abiding Jews, because very much still, I don't think it, we would define it in our time, the difference between the Orthodox and the non-Orthodox was Tisha B'Av. But for about, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> about a hundred years, Tisha B'Av and what you did on this occasion, and I could share many other texts of Orthodox expressing indignation that reform would hold soirees on Tisha B'Av accidentally, but how could you, how could you have the compunction to mire Tisha B'Av in such a way? How could you forget about Tisha B'Av? Tisha B'Av was the dividing line. What you did in July or August, whenever it fell out, was indicative of your religious beliefs. And so Tishbab in Orthodox and traditional Jewish camping became a hallmark. They invested time, energy, charisma in trying to energize Tishbab because if you were to capture Tishbab in the imagination of Jewish young people, of children, then you maybe stood a chance of inserting a foothold into their futures as Orthodox Jews. And so a much more well-known camp 
uh, traditional camp, uh, many uh, conservative Orthodox children attended it, Mossad. Uh, I think it closed uh, about two or three decades ago. But at its time, uh, I think uh, it's Rabbi Haskell Lukstein who speaks so fondly of the impressions that uh, Mossad made on him. Uh, from the earliest days of Mossad, and this is an article from 1951 in a, uh, in, uh, a Zionist magazine called The Jewish Frontier. Mossad, an experiment in Hebrew summer camping. Some of my friends have uh, just published, uh, Jonathan Krasner and uh, Sarah ben Menor have written a really wonderful new book on Jewish camping. From the earliest days of the Mossad idea, its founders put their accent on all those forms of Jewish life, which are instrumental in the preservation of Judaism, preserving Jude to inculcate, to incubate Judaism. That's what summer camp could do. It was away from your urban or newly suburban centers. It was away from your par the parents who, what was their uh, observance of Jewishness, it varied. Camp was a way to move children away from the usual sites of their lives and to foster that sense of Jewishness. Few students of Jewish history doubt the tremendous importance of, rel of religious precept and practice in the survival scheme. At Massad, the prayers the observance of Shabbat, see, they use Shabbat, uh, the uh, impressive rites of Tisha B'Av and other religious observances become integral and functional because they assume their natural place in the total, totality of Jew Jewish living, excuse me. And he's giving us pedagogical sort of, what we call today experiential uh, Jewish education. He's, he's writing about it. Shadovsky was one of the founders of Kam Asad, of the import of actualizing, of doing Jewishness. And Tisha B'Av was listed at the center, one of the centerpieces of the Jewish camping experience. And finally, and finally, uh, I wanna alert us, uh, this is actually the very first time I'm saying this aloud, the late uh, Rabbi Norman Lamb. It's, uh, it's crazy, it's sad, it's miserable. Uh, Rabbi Lamb, uh, in uh, 1956, so this is what he looked like in 1956 as a, uh, at that time, a young rabbi in Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, no goatee yet. Uh, he writes one of the uh, first major essays uh, in a now reviving Orthodox community, a community that in about 15 years he would call the modern Orthodox community, in about 35 years he would call the centrist Orthodox community, and about 50 years later he would revert back to modern Orthodoxy. Um, and he writes the following, practically the continued observance of Tisha B'Av must concern itself with the two great historical events of modern times, as well as with past history. Those are Chorban Europa and the founding of Medina Israel. This is 1956. It's after the Holocaust and it's after Kamas Medina. A valid Orthodox view on the question of continued observance of the national fast day based on halachic grounds writing in an Orthodox Union Jewish newspaper, or magazine, excuse me, Jewish Life, sees no need of discarding them because of contemporary developments. It sees rather in the great historic events of the last two decades an opportunity for deepening our experience of these days, an occasion for discovering new avenues of expression of the entire gamut of our national experience than rather than without the framework of the hallowed traditions of Israel. By blending these historic events into the grand stream of Jewish religious life, we will find an opportunity. We'll find an opportunity for forgiving, uh, forgiving, excuse me, new dimensions to our near emasculated religious consciousness. And so for Rabbi Lamb, and it's an attitude that would be um, really explored deeply uh, by Rabbi Soloveitchik and posthumously so much as uh, provided to us. So much of our learning is now scaffolded uh, by Rabbi Soloveitchik's teachings. Uh, my teacher, Rabbi uh, Jacob J. Schachter, uh, published a volume of his keynote. Um, I know uh, there are, I know Coren produced one, um, and they are really the, uh, the framework for it. And, uh, and, and Rabbi Lamb taps into it, knowingly or not. He was already a student of, of Rabbi Soloveitchik by then. 
Um, but it's the emergence of the state of Israel, a realization of a Zionist dream, although for religious Zionists, uh, there would be more work uh, to be done on that, on that path, but also of Chorban Europa, of the Holocaust, of the Shoah, of injecting even more meaning, um, making the tragedies of Chorban Beis Amigdash very present, slightly different, but much more present in the 20th century. And so the Tishba has to, has to, it has to loom large in the North American Jewish experience because it has been modernized. I don't mean modernized in the sense that we have offered a liberal philosophy. I mean, we have made meaning out of Tishba with current events. If it languished, if it lingered about in the mid 19th century, if not just Reform Jews who were exercising liberal theologies to reinvent it, to reincarnate it, but if it was floundering among the tradition abiding Jews, as we saw in that text from Max Lilienthal, it was because it was difficult to make meaning out of Tishba. But by the 1880s, because of the rise of anti Semitism, because of the hope of Zionism, and then in the 20th century, because of renewed spirits within Jewish education, particularly in camping, but event, and, and also because of even grander hopes for the Zionist experiment. And finally, when, when Hakama Samadina in 1948, but also preceding that by a few years, the tragedy, the sorrow of the Holocaust, they all coalesce, they all blend together to make meaning for Tishba. It makes it present. If it was difficult to relate to a villain like the Vilchanetzar or Titus or Vespasian or Chalmanitsky or Ferdinand and Isabella, if we have lost our ability and our awareness to append Yamach Shemo Vizichro to all of their names, it was not difficult to do that for the Nazis Yamach Shemo Vizichro post the 1940s. <clears throat> If America was a happy land, and maybe it still is, but it shares that or it plays a second role, a secondary role to the state of Israel and the Zionist dream. Tisha B'Av moves along in our ability to make it contemporary, to make it present. And that's what we did. That's what we did this morning with the keynote, didn't we? We read the text in Hebrew or in English, very difficult Hebrew. And we tried to make meaning out of it. We asked ourselves, in the age of COVID, how can I relate to Tisha B'Av differently than I did last year? It's a different episode, but it's very much the same as our forebears. We have always looked to Tisha B'Av as a community, as an opportunity to blend the past and the present. When we're able to do that, Tisha B'Av rises higher and higher in importance and also in our meaningfulness and in our ability to shed tears for all the different occasions and for to hope and hopefully to shed tears in hopefulness for a future that's brighter, that's healthier, that's safer, one in which maybe lofi koladeos, uh, based on Gemara and Rosh Hashanah, that there won't be a, a tissue of sorrow anymore that'll be of joy. Thank you so, so much. Thank you very much. I'll let you answer one question, but uh, you talked about the, the keynote and uh, what we did this morning. So that's our next lecture. Rabbi Dr. Mar Marty Lakshin will be speaking on the history, poetry, and, and lament reading in the keynote. So that will start in, uh, in six minutes. Um, the only sort of, uh, I'd say more a comment than, than a question, and I guess reflective of, you know, how it was a different world back in the 1800s, uh, a happy land with all the slavery going on. You know, if you see that, in the chat box, but I just right, think I see that. So, so um, right. So, obviously, there's uh, what we would call today white privilege, and um, and uh, Harvey was something of a southern gentleman. Um, I don't believe he had slaves, though. I would have to look that up. But I don't believe he did. Um, he's living in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, true. The unevenness of whose happiness was obviously evident in that, and obviously resonates very much for our time. Right, I wasn't. It wasn't my happy. I didn't make the speech either. No, I get you. I'm just saying. Right, this no, is. No, that's a good point. It's a very, very good point. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that you. historical overview and. Uh,
interesting how you know uh, how Tishvav you know comes to a yontif. That's uh, they're just uh, they're slightly ahead of our times, as they used to say in the the commercial, if you can say. But hopefully, yeah, we'll yeah. we'll get there one day. But uh, thank you and.